First, I want to talk about Africa, which we've talked about a lot tonight. But by the end of the century, Africa is going to be home to one of every three young people on the planet. How does that inform your work and your investments? Yeah, it's a huge challenge that the places where uh, babies will be born are increasingly the toughest places in the world. You know, the, the number of babies been born has peaked and is going down slightly, but the portion uh, that are born in Africa will go over the course of the century from about 22% today to about 50% by the end of the century. And that, you know, Africa today is only a billion of 7.3 billion people. So the fact that that's where half the children were born by the end of the century speaks to this issue. And even within Africa, it's places like Niger, or the north of Nigeria, where uh, you'll still have a lot of kids being born. And so, you know, we have to help those governments get their primary education right, uh, get their, uh, get all the, the things that we take for granted. Uh, fortunately, some countries are graduating, you know, you know, China, Brazil, Indonesia, even India, uh, things are going well enough that they'll be able to support almost all of their own needs. And so Africa, with, it's primarily Africa with a few additional countries where all the foreign aid and philanthropy can focus in because of the success in most of Asia and Latin America with uh, these, these very tough issues. One of the things that surprised us when we got into this work, and I think is worth mentioning tonight, is that as you save these children's lives, that is, as Bill said, death rates of children under the age of five have been cut in half. There used to be this fear around the world that if you cut childhood death rate, then you would have massive overpopulation. But the, luckily, the converse is true, that parents in these low-income settings, they are making a, basically an insurance bet. They want to know that several of their children will survive till adult, adulthood. So as they can see that their children survive, they actually will bring down, they want to bring down the number of kids that they have. But today there are still many, many places like northern Nigeria or Niger that you go um, where if you sit in a village, and I've done this, and you sit and there's maybe 150 women, the men have gone back to the fields to work, and you stay and talk to the women and you say, how many of you know um, a woman who's lost a child in childbirth, literally every single hand will go up. And then if you say, how many of you have lost a child in childbirth, you'll still see about 40% of the hands go up. So they've seen so much death with, with children, they're having a lot to make sure a few survive. And yet, women will say to you over and over and over again, I wanna have fewer children, but what happened? What happened to that clinic that used to have contraceptives for me? What happened to the fact that, okay, the clinic's still there, but there's no supply of what I want to use? And so one of the things that we got, have gotten deeply involved in is access to contraceptives because 220 million women are telling us they want access. And so if families can, we know from great research and data in Bangladesh that if a family, if parents can bring down the number of children they have, their children are healthier, their children are better educated, and the family is wealthier. It is the greatest anti-poverty tool. And so if you think about why women, for instance, in the United States have the opportunity to work, it was the advent of the pill. And so we are quite uh, determined to help women have access to the tools that they want around the world. And that will help with some of the population numbers in Africa, but that is not the yeah. reason to do it. So I want to end with this question of a potential breakthrough that you see coming, whether it's something you're working on within the foundation or that you're just seeing generally that you're most hopeful and optimistic about? Yeah, I have a lot that I could name. Uh, you know, just in the vaccine field alone, uh, there's great hope that in the next 10 or 15 years we'd have a vaccine for tuberculosis and HIV and malaria, so the big, uh, the big, big killers. Uh, and that's why it's worth holding HIV in check until we get that tool that we can stop uh, people from getting infected. In terms of the thing I'm most excited about, I go back to nutrition. Uh, the fact that 40% that of the kids never have their, their body or brain fully developed 
and that by solving that growth problem, having them have full growth, they uh, will also survive even tough episodes of, of these diseases. That is so exciting, and it's, it, it, it requires genetic sequencing, it requires big data, it requires all these tools that 10 years ago, the microbiome, uh, which I wasn't the first to mention that, uh, I always try not to use too many two of the scientific words, but she said it first. Uh, uh, that microbiome was opaque because uh, it, the amount of sequencing and data processing you have to do to even understand what's going on. These are the bacteria going in your gut. Uh, that's a th the single thing, single thing that I'm, I'm most excited about and I see uh, will be very likely in this decade to dramatically reduce malnutrition. Melinda, anything to add to that? Well, I, the thing that I think is imperative for the world, in addition, absolutely, the science which moves us forward, is we have to empower women and girls. And if you want to lift up societies, you empower and educate girls. And you start, it starts in most of these countries with good health, because if you don't have decent health, you can't go on to get a great education. But the more and more and more I've seen, and the longer we've been in this work, is um, you lift up women, and they're, they're going to lift up everybody else. And you see it time and time again. And so we're quite dedicated to doing that as well.